I'm Jason Stipp from Morningstar. As company defined benefit pension plans become a rare species, the 401k has become many investors' primary investment vehicle, but they're not all cut from the same cloth. Here to talk about the pros and cons of 401ks is Christine Benz, our director of personal finance. Thanks for being here, Christine. Jason, great to be here. So uh, 401ks uh, can be a great vehicle for investors. In fact, it's maybe the only choice through your employer for a lot of investors. There are some pros and cons that you should keep in mind about investing in 401ks. Let's start with uh, the pros of 401ks, you say one of the biggest is just the discipline that the 401k brings to the retirement investing process. Right. It's enforced discipline. Your contributions go in without you having to lift a finger except to initially get the thing going. So it does keep you investing in good markets and in bad. And that, I think, tends to serve as a safeguard against investors' own worst behavioral tendencies. The other thing is that um, they really make it easy for people who are a little bit lazy about their investments so you can add on nice features that can get your plan back into whack. So you can put in place auto escalation in a lot of plans so your contributions bump up if you get a raise in salary. You can also auto rebalance if you want to have your uh, portfolio periodically scaled back to your target allocation. So those are additional features that a lot of plans have these days and they really make it quite easy to stay disciplined and stay on track with your plan. Another very important feature of many 401k plans is some form of employer match, which can really make your money work a lot harder. Absolutely. So regardless of the quality of your plan, once you've done a little bit of homework on what the investment options are like, you do want to contribute at least enough to earn that match if your company is indeed offering one. That's something that you will not get, obviously, if you invest outside of the confines of a plan. One thing that a plan can bring to investors is because it uh, may be a bigger company, you might have access to funds you wouldn't necessarily have access to otherwise, or you might get a better uh, deal on some of those funds, perhaps? Absolutely. So there are institutional share classes of mutual funds. They often feature very, very low costs alongside the share classes that are available to retail investors buying the funds on their own. So that is a nice perk for 401k investors if they are in a larger plan where the management company has swung a nice deal on behalf of participants. Your total cost load for owning that plan can be very, very low. An additional thing, Jason, is that there are investment types that only appear within 401k plans. You won't find them outside of them. So stable value funds, for example, would be one option. The key feature there is that you do typically get a higher interest rate than you would earn on your cash, but you get all of the safety or nearly all of the safety of cash, or you get cash-like attributes, I should say. People who invest in the thrift savings plan that is available to federal government employees have a nice option that is somewhat similar called the G fund where you have higher interest rates, but again, um, a, a lot of safety built in. You will not get these particular funds outside of uh, the 401k, 403b plan confines. Uh, in some states, there might also be some additional asset protection for funds that you have housed in a 401k. That's right. And this does vary by state, but typically um, in many states, the, the 401k plan assets are safeguarded against bankruptcy, uh, or uh, any sort of lawsuit that you might find yourself involved in, you do have some greater safeguards than you would if you had your money within an IRA or in some sort of taxable brokerage account. And lastly, on the pro side, there are some very important tax benefits to saving in the 401k as far as reducing your taxable income now, and also there's ongoing benefits. That's right. So if you are making, if you're contributing to a traditional, IR, traditional 401k, you will earn a tax break on your contribution, so your money will go in on a pre-tax basis. It will accumulate on a tax-deferred basis. You'll owe money on the way out when you're in retirement and taking withdrawals. If you are contributing to a Roth, uh, Roth 401k, the tax treatment is almost exactly the opposite. So you will put in taxable contributions. You'll have that tax-deferred compounding, and you'll be able to take tax-free withdrawals. Either way, it's a nice tax break. On the flip side, um, not all 401ks are the same. So the tax benefits are the same across all 401ks, but the investments within those 401ks, for example, are different. You do want to do some due diligence when you're looking at the options in your 401k. Absolutely, because the quality can vary to such an extreme. Oftentimes, unfortunately, it breaks down to the size of the plan. So generally speaking, the larger your plan, the more likely you are to find some of those very low-cost investment options. You're more likely to find that a little bit more thought and care 
care went into putting together the plan. Of course, I often talk to people who say, wait, I work for a large employer. I don't like my plan that much. But generally speaking, people in smaller plans might be contending with higher cost options. They might also have a layer of administrative fees in addition to anything that's embedded within the funds themselves. So you'd want to do your homework about the quality of your plan. Specifically, you're looking at the investment options, and you can find research on those individual funds on Morningstar.com. But you also want to look for what's called the summary plan description. It's a document about your plan available from your employer. You want to look specifically at the administrative costs being levied on participants. And you say folks who are older and may have more fixed income in certain plans, they might find their options more limited. Right. And this has just been in my casual observation looking at other people's 401k plans. That's where I found that menus on 401k plans often fall short is in the fixed income option. Um, I recently looked at a plan, for example, where the sole option was a government bond fund, sort of an intermediate term government bond fund. That's not enough for someone who is uh, getting close to retirement. They need more diversity in their bond holdings at that point. So certainly if that's you, if you're if you're in that position and you're looking at very limited choices in, in bond fund land, you'd want to make sure that you're augmenting your 401k holdings with holdings outside of the 401k plan to give you a little bit of extra diversification. And you mentioned that there can be extra layers of fees in some 401ks. How do I know when that is excessive? That's it, a really good question, Jason. Um, I, I typically think if you are looking at the administrative costs, anything that's much higher than, say, 0.5% is a lot. And that is a significant headwind and, headwind and possibly negates some of the positive features that might come along with your plan. You may be better off just contributing enough to earn the match in that plan, whatever your employer is making in terms of matching contributions, then go outside of that plan, make Roth IRA contributions or traditional IRA contributions if you can get a tax break on your contribution. Then if you find you still have money to go back and invest, then you can look at the 401k plan again. But that's the sequence I would use if I were stuck in a high cost 401k plan. And you said that you might be paying some fees even if you don't see that administrative fee as a separate line item in your plan. Right. So plans do it in different ways. They may charge it as an explicit line item. You might see the administrative expenses. But sometimes the fund company simply um, offers a higher cost menu of funds. So you're in a higher cost share class that embeds some of those administrative costs. So just if, if you don't see that high administrative fee, you still want to make sure that you're looking at the expense ratios on a fund by fund basis because those admin costs could be stuck there. And you mentioned earlier that for 401k uh, assets will be taxable when you do make withdrawals in retirement. And also with 401ks, you have to make withdrawals at some point in retirement. That's right. Required minim minimum distributions come into play once you hit age 70 and a half. And they're a fact of life for people in 401ks, whether traditional or Roth. Although if you do have a Roth 401k, you can simply convert to a Roth IRA and you won't owe in any taxes. If you are in a traditional 401k and you want to get your money over into the Roth column, your only option then is to do a conversion and that will be a taxable event for you. So RMDs are a fact of life if you're sticking within a traditional 401k. Well, certainly a lot of benefits to 401ks, but they're not created equal. You certainly have to do your homework. Thanks for helping us with those details today. Thank you, Jason. For Morningstar, I'm Jason Stipp. Thanks for watching.